Are we shot for top 10 fails using the seven stage RODI system for BRS? But uh, we failed at that even. No uh, <laughs> yeah, we have 12. So there's 12 major mistakes you could use uh, doing one of these things. Let's find them out today so you can learn from our mistakes so you don't have to. Number one, I bet you this is done wrong 90% of the time. Yeah, and the mistake is changing out the sediment filters and the carbon blocks at the same time. I mean, they make it really easy because they come in a kit, uh, but these three stages right here shouldn't be changed out at the exact same time. Yeah, in most cases anyway. Yeah. So with the, the sediment filter, you should change it out based on two things. One, visually when it looks dirty yeah. uh, and it's clogged but really pressure gauge. So when you see the pressure gauge uh, start to drop, it means the sediment filter is uh, clogged. It's just a few dollar filter. And if it's dropping the pressure, all of the other things, all the other performance aspects of the whole system go down, your DI resin consumption will go up, it'll be a lot more expensive than just simply changing out the filter on time. So the carbon blocks will often last a lot longer than the sediment filter. Mm -hmm. So if you're changing out uh, your carbon blocks just because the sediment filter got clogged, you're probably leaving some savings on the table. So in the spirit of saving every last dollar, uh, there's another one. Yeah, so uh, you are probably making a mistake of changing both of the carbon blocks out at the same time as well. Uh, for those before we went to the Pro Series DI, if you remember having two regular stages of DI resin and just swapping one out for the other one and putting a fresh one on the other side, you can do the same thing with your carbon blocks. So if you're uh, reducing three parts per million uh, uh, carb or uh, a chlorine out uh, with the carbon block here, they're not 100% efficient, none of them. So mm. it's just dramatically reducing it. So maybe out of this one is coming out like 0.2 uh, mm -hmm. parts per million chlorine into here. So by the time this one's fully depleted, the second one here will actually be only partially depleted. So if you wanted to, you could save some money by porting this one over here and putting the brand new one as the second one. All right, so number three, you can't really do this by default here, but some people will do a DIY project and reconfigure this and then make this mistake. Yeah, so the mistake is testing the, trying to test the TDS between the cation and the anion stage. It will be higher, it's worthless to test. Yeah, so you might think, well, hey, I took out half of the cations. I should drop by half. Nope, you actually <laughs> won't work that way. So the way that these works is uh, one of them will exchange a hydrogen. The other one will tra exchange a hydroxide. They combine together to create pure water. If I only do one of those steps, I've actually just got a bunch of contaminants and a bunch of either hydrogen or a bunch of hydroxide. It doesn't work. In fact, the way that it reads electrical conductivity, the TDS may actually look like it went up. Mm -hmm. So there's zero value measuring the TDS in between the two single stages, only after it, and then as well as after the mix bed as well. All right, number four, not drywall holes, not uh, you know just kind of using you know wall dogs or whatever. <laughs> uh, those are bad solutions. Yeah, don't make the mistake of just kind of loosely uh, mounting these. If you can, at least get a stud. But even better, put another two by reinforce in between those studs to mount this thing. The uh, pressure that it takes to unscrew some of these starts to wrench on your wall. You might even dry pull it right out of the drywall. Yeah, you definitely want to go into studs. And if for whatever reason your studs aren't spaced the right uh, uh, length for these things, mm -hmm. what you can do is cut a piece of uh, two by four and then screw that into the studs and then mount this and that. But you know, you are cranking on, it's full of a lot of water, it's pretty heavy. Mm -hmm. So you know, if you don't want to damage your wall, make sure that you mounted it correctly. Number five, this will be really obvious after the fact, but sometimes not so before. Yeah, don't put this thing in sunlight. So you'll probably end up wind up seeing like green growth or algae growth or something in the lines or especially in the canisters. We kind of see some of it here in our systems because these overhead lights are on almost 24 hours a day, mm -hmm. uh, but just avoid direct sunlight. Yeah, so that's the nature of it is sometimes people will mount this in like warm weather states. So they'll try to mount it outside in the sunlight. They'll mount it in a garage where it gets sunlight through a window. But the nature of these clear uh, canisters is they can actually grow algae in it. Specifically, if you have like a well water or non-chlorinated water, mm. there might be like some remnants of algae yeah. in your actual uh, water. But there also might be nutrients in there like uh, nitrogen and phosphorus in the water. In the case of if you have chloramines, you definitely have nitrogen in the form of ammonia in there feeding this type of thing. So just try to keep it out of direct light. 
Number six, people do this one all the time as well. Yeah, so avoiding sunlight's important, but also don't make the mistake of putting it in hot areas or freezing areas. So some people think, hey, I might put it in my garage. And it, you know, in the winter time, it's probably good, uh, but it can freeze in there. It can also get super hot in there. You don't want either. Yeah, the hot part is a little less of a deal as yeah. freezing. Freezing water causes all kinds of problems with every seal in the whole thing. So, and filters. Yeah, so in your garage, unless your garage heated all the time, or you're just never, ever, ever gonna run into a freezing issue, so be it. But if you're living in a state where freezing is an issue, uh, obviously don't put it in an area like that, mm -hmm. uh, especially outside. And then heat is a little bit more of a concentrated issue. It kind of related to direct sunlight or a garage mm -hmm. that gets really, really, really hot. But really try to keep it out of extreme temperature ranges. All right, number seven, you can make a big mess this way. Yeah, so when you're installing this thing, do not make the mistake of taking your time when you're splicing into your home's water or making hard connections, especially like under the sinks or in those water, you know, the water lines coming from your sink or your toilet or wherever you're tapping into, make it waterproof. Leak proof. One thing I've learned is uh, if it can happen, it will happen. So if you just kind of like uh, loosely connected it and then you know through the drain line down the drain, mm. well, before you know it, somebody bumps it, the drain wiggles its way out, and then it's just spraying wastewater over your floor until you notice. Uh, so really, like take the time to do the hard connections. It's really easy to put the little fitting on your cold water line mm -hmm. so you can connect it permanently, and also the drain line to connect it directly into your drain. It's really easy and it will save you a mess in the future. Number eight, if there's one thing uh, I think already I'm going to tell you to learn today, it's this. Yeah, so do not make the mistake of ignoring this pressure gauge. It will tell you, not only it will tell you when your like, sediment filter is getting clogged or whatnot, but it will also tell you a lot of other performance in the RO unit. Here's the thing. Uh, there is a white canister with a membrane on here. All the rest of it's garbage. <laughs> uh, not quite. But these are all filtration periods just, just to get the water prepped for mm -hmm. the membrane. The membrane's doing 99% of the work. The DI resin is doing the last percent, yep. uh, or last few percent. So here's the thing, is the pressure going into the membrane is the most important function of the whole thing. You've seen the video we did on pressure, and you can mm -hmm. actually see it at 50, 60, 70, 80, at like uh, uh, PSI and how performance gets better and better. But we'll also see how dismal it gets below 50 oh, and yeah. 40 and 30, right? So if you pay attention to this, it's the single most important thing to pay attention to on the whole system. Number nine, I failed at this for years, uh, maybe a decade, and now it's super obvious why I shouldn't be doing that. Yeah, the mistake, and you've probably heard this in a lot of other videos where we talk about DI resin, is letting your DI resin deplete all the way up until the entire canister has changed color, and uh, you're probably gone too far. Yeah, the nature of that is like, well, I want to get all the use out of it I can possibly get. What do you mean? Uh, well, as soon as it reads one part per million, I uh, will uh, stop using it. Mm. However, the problem is it doesn't release the stuff universal. So uh, when, you know, the one TDS in there, it's actually the worst of the TDS. <laughs> so it kind of cakes in here and layers out in mm -hmm. terms of its affinity for the resin. And the thing that has the least affinity Ammonia. ammonia. Second one is silica. So uh, right in here, as these bands create, you won't be able to see them, but visually think the ammonia band, especially if you have chloramines, are building up and building up and building up. So once you hit that first, like, you know, I hit one or two TDS, it's one or two parts per million ammonia that you're dosing into the tank here. So bad, bad news. So you want to catch it like right before it, it exhausts, like an inch or so. If you really feel like, oh, I really want to get all the use out of it, then use two stages of mixed bed, and then you can find that you can let it go all the way, and the second one will catch it, replace the first one, swap them out. Or, in this case, with the seven stage, you can do the same thing using each stage because the mix bed here is actually the fail safe on the end. All right, so number 10, one filter doesn't fit all, but we try to start with the best. Yeah, so the mistake is uh, not solving rapidly clogging filters, specifically this uh, sediment filter. We ship it with the uh, one micron, which is a smaller micron size. So for some people that might clog up a little too fast, but there is a solution. So one micron is very small, like mm. a silty, silty sediment. 
uh, you might have really large, like rusty type sediment or uh, mm. mucky even. And uh, five micron is a way better solution. So it can capture particles throughout the entire thickness of the filter. So if you're finding that you are burning through your sediment filter with the one microns too fast, you might want to try five. It's counterintuitive what the way many people think but it'll actually allow you to use the entire filter. The only way that isn't the case, and it's pretty rare, is if you have a lot of super fine one micron silty, then the five micron filter will let it through, mm. which will deplete your carbon block faster. But you know, if you're having a problem, don't just accept it. Try to figure out the right tool for the right job. All right, number 11. I think I've heard this 3,000, maybe 30,000 times. Yeah, the mistake is uh, worrying about the air that's left over or trapped inside your DI stages. If there's air in there, that's actually a good sign. Yeah, so the way it works is the air needs, uh, water comes in the outside and then goes down the side and has to travel back up through the, the cartridge. The reason the air's getting in there is there's no way for the air to circumvent that. Mm -hmm. It just gets trapped in there. It doesn't really matter. You got if, a good seal. Yeah, it, it's actually a sign that you got a good seal in the cartridge. If you really want to, you can open it up and let it fill if it just visually bothers you. And the reason that we don't go down the middle of the cartridge and have it, like in that case, the air would come out, is we'll actually get a lot of the air stuck inside the cartridge itself, which is bad. So mm. uh, the air is actually a sign that the seal's working right. You can solve it if visually it bothers you, but really you shouldn't worry about it. All right, number 12, you pack the hell out of this thing, <laughs> uh, and you're like, ah, oh, man, I put all the effort in it. But after a while, it starts to separate a little bit at the bottom. Yeah, so don't make the mistake of not realizing that the uh, DI resin, specifically like anion, but most DI resins will actually shrink over time. Yeah, so the fact that you packed it right is important to begin with, but uh, it will shrink over time as it's getting consumed. Mm -hmm. uh, not the way that you think. The anion resin just changes uh, in size over time. So uh, just know that that there, it's normal to see a small amount of air build up on the top, on the bottom over time. All right, so if there's only one thing you heard today, let it be this. Yeah, for me, so you bought a full filter kit, resist the urge to swap them all out at one time. You're probably actually wasting some money. Yeah, and for me, you already heard it, pressure gauge. And the way that it's installed right now comes after the last carbon block and going into the RO membrane that will tell you when these filters are clogged and you should replace them. The pressure gauge is the number one factor, more important than anything else on this whole system. It should be around 50 or higher. If not, you're leaving some room on the table to get better performance, or even worse, you're actually getting lousy performance. All right, so Thomas actually has like a spotlight on the seven stage if you wanna watch that, or you can learn more about the seven stage right here.